Calaroga Shark Media. Hello, I'm Johnny Mack with your daily comedy news. Donnell Rawlings out doing press, but everybody keeps asking him about Dave Chappelle. Rawlings told the Washington Post two years ago, we shot a special in North Carolina where I got a standing ovation a month before deciding if it was going to air. Dave pulled it. He said, I could put you in front of an audience and you'll destroy the room. But that doesn't make it a great special. Well said, Dave Chappelle. Donnell said, I had to listen to this little constructive criticism, not getting my feelings and understand what he was saying. Donnell talked about the creativity he and Chappelle bring out in each other, telling the Post, staying true to the artistry of what we do, not just giving into trends, we push each other. It's a very, very healthy competition. Dave sees me do a set, I might get a standing O. I know that's going to make him want to give it his all. Same thing with me and Earthquake. We went out on tour together last year and we alternated who would close the show. We push each other to be great. It's no days off when we work with each other. Then I'll move from L.A. to Yellow Springs, Ohio, where Dave Chappelle is also based. He says, I realized Hollywood is overrated. You can create a good lifestyle for yourself not being there. So I went from the streets to the creeks and from the hoods to the woods. Love it. Some more advice from Dave Chappelle via Donnell Rawlings. Dave said, if you want to see a comic, come and check him out after he's filmed a special because now it's a new process. I can't use the jokes I use in the special. I've got to go deeper. This is a time when comics really test their armor. Great stuff. The Daily Beast also spoke to Donnell and also discussed Dave Chappelle. And he says, I don't have to come to Dave's defense, but I do defend him. We're best friends. It's not just that we work together. We've been to funerals together. We've been to cookouts together. So if you talk sideways, I can't listen to it. Take that stuff to somebody else, but not to me, because he's like a brother. If you say something to my family member, then I'm going to check you. If people say, Dave got in trouble, you might have three people that didn't like it and 97 people that loved it, but the focus is on those three people as opposed to the 97. And I think people like Dave, people like myself, people like Chris Rock, we're taking back who we appreciate and we're showing them love. And that 3% can go kick rocks. I love it. He actually said kick rocks. I'm not cleaning that up. Does Rawlings understand why people are upset about Chappelle's jokes targeting the trans community? Donnell says, you want my honest opinion? No. Dave's point on everything is like, I understand you, I hear you, but that doesn't mean I have to agree with everything that you're saying. People want to find something to be mad at. There are some people who aren't happy unless they're mad. And the real reason why I take offense to that is because you're trying to destroy my friend's character. And I know how hard he tries to be fair. I watched Donnell's new special on Netflix I found it to be just yelling, like just yelling. I didn't last long. I was like, this is not enjoyable. So then I switched over to Jenny Slate's special that's just out on Amazon Prime. It lasted a little longer there, but just wasn't feeling it. And as I shared in the Facebook group, Daily Common News podcast group, I have to find a special before I turn into the Johnny Mac just hates everything. Here we are. It's March, and I only have two specials on the uh, best of 2024 list, which right now is... Number one, Dusty Slay. Number two, Taylor Tomlinson. And I I think Taylor Tomlinson's is going to fall to like number 20 by the end of the year. Not on the list. Pete Davidson, Jackie Novak, Kevin James, Rory Scovel, Donnell Rawlings, Jenny Slate. It's early, though. I remember last year this time it was like Nate Bregazzi and not much else. So we'll see how the summer goes. After I didn't enjoy Donnell and then I didn't enjoy Jenny Slate, I switched over to The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and... Johnny Mac hates everything. I think MSNBC nailed it here. John Stewart's third appearance in the anchor chair open with the host basking in a standing ovation. Yep. And then he made the topic Israel-Palestine and he got kind of serious. And I was like, mm, I tried to hang with you, John, and I bailed. MSNBC writes the popular genre of which Stewart is a master blends comedy and political analysis, all the while smuggling in whatever moral convictions the comic might possess. Politainment. I like that. Looks like real news. I'm saying I like that a lot today, isn't I? Hmm. I wonder what that's about. Do I say that all the time? Its graphics are so eye-popping, the Chiron's so abundant, its shiny sets so CNN-like, one expects Wolf Blitzer to pop in, projecting a winner in the Michigan primary. Politainment radiates a weird sort of winking authority and even moral gravitas. Audiences and even comedians themselves risk forgetting that their newsreader is neither a credentialed journalist nor a scholar, but a person whose core competency is genital gags. Stewart tried to maintain a semblance of ideological balance as a news person would, but in a conflict this raw, complex, and emotionally charged, he likely satisfied very few. Some things just aren't funny. So then I switched over to John Oliver, and as I prepped the show today, I'm really confused. I definitely had John Oliver on. I definitely was enjoying it, but I don't remember a thing about it. I can't tell you a single joke. I don't remember what the main topic was. And here's what's scarier to me. I don't remember turning it off. 
Did I finish the episode? I remember sitting on the same couch. This was not the sleepy chair. I didn't pass out. I was awake. I was watching this. I had Oliver on, and at some point I switched over to watching YouTube videos. But I don't remember turning Oliver off, or did I complete it? Did I bail halfway? I don't know, and this troubles me. I have a memory gap. I told you the other day about four comedians whose gig at a Seattle comedy club was canceled. One of those comedians, Jim Florentine, he told Como News, we got this email saying, listen, we did some research and you basically can't come to the club. There was a whole thing about we're a progressive area and we check with our community and your values and my values don't align with the other comics. This is such a big deal. Even Rob Schneider has weighed in. Rob tweeted, dear Seattle, if you're worried about hearing ideas separate than your own, if a person standing on a stage saying words that may challenge your opinions frightens you, if you only want approved ideas that keep you in your safe political bubble, you can thank your local comedy club. Uh, look, I, as I said yesterday, I've got no problem with a club saying, hey, we've got a particular vibe here. For example, if I opened a uh, rock club and you came in and you said, well, you know, we're like a country rock band. And I said, well, that's not really what we do here. I don't think I have to book you. Now, why they were booked and unbooked, that's a separate conversation. But if this comedy club wants to go, you know, hey, we're doing this kind of thing. Like, say you're in Brooklyn and you're running an alt comedy scene. And Jim Norton, who's a good guy that I've worked with, we're friendly. If Jim Norton wanted to play your alt comedy club and just do jokes about hookers in Las Vegas for an hour, it doesn't fit. It doesn't mean Jim's not good. It just doesn't fit your alt comedy scene in Brooklyn. It's okay. Rob Schneider is incredibly fascinating. Don Jameson said, I always keep things positive here on Twitter, but Capitol Hill Comedy Club in Seattle can hose right off. <laughs> Steve Mudflap McGrew said, I hope the club goes belly up. The empty building burns down from drug addicts using it to shoot up with the free needles the city gives. And then the shell of the business is bulldozed down. Then the bricks are washed and used to build a new church for better humans than the ones who own the club. Florentine said, I'm not even really that mad at it. It's just weird that they booked us. Kurt Metzger, one of the unbooked comedians, I'm trying not to use the word canceled because, you know, that means something else these days. The four are Dave Smith, Louis J. Gomez, Jim Florentine, and Kurt Metzger. Kurt said, they're going to go out of business. They don't have real comics coming in. I looked at the lineup. Let's take a look at the lineup. All right, tonight's an open mic. Katie Boyle is your headliner Friday and Saturday. We've got a roast battle on Sunday. Monday Night Queers to the Front, Tuesday, Washington's Funniest Mammal. I'm clicking on that. What's that? Hmm, I clicked on it. It's not listed. But I do see Dave Merhej is playing there. He's solid. All right, Washington's Funniest Mammal. Washington's Funniest Mammal has their own website. Cozy Comedy founders Travis and Marcus have been producing local comedy shows. The goal of Cozy Comedy is simple. Bring local comedians to places that haven't ever seen them. Uh, first round, 50 total comedians, five shows, 10 comedians per show. Each comedian gets seven minutes. Top three from each show move on to the semis. Show winners receive $200. Semi-final rounds, 15 comics. You get the idea. Final round, four comics. That's why this thing is three nights. That's not terrible. Again, the weirdness is why book them and then unbook them. Meanwhile, in New Westminster, British Columbia, a show featuring comedy troupe Danger Cats has been canceled after public outrage over the group's sale of T-shirts depicting a particular serial killer. Here at Daily Comedy News, we do not promote serial killing, so I will not mention the name of the serial killer. As far as serial killers go, it was not a serial killer whose name I was familiar with. I don't think I'm an expert on serial killers, but it wasn't like that uh, famous guy from the 1970s in New York City. Again, I'm not saying the names of serial killers. In a now-deleted Facebook post, the House of Comedy BC wrote it had decided to cancel the event, saying it missed the mark and aims to do better. The post had read, while we value and support the freedom of expression and comedy, we recognize that the chosen material for this show has caused discomfort in our community. When asked by CBC News for more details, the VP of Operations said they had no comment. Hmm. <laughs> now I've popped over to the Danger Cats website. They use uh, a font I think is similar to the font Def Leppard uses. They also use a font similar to Grand Theft Auto. They're about us, says, for those that understand living it to the fullest comes with a good time and a cold one in hand. I'm going to click on this merch tab they have here. Let me see what comes up. We could get a flag in that Def Leppard-ish font. Um, there is some sort of t-shirt here. I believe it is an image of Justin Trudeau doing brown face uh, from an event in 2001. Here's another t-shirt in the style of Guns N' Roses album covers, another one in the style of the Rolling Stones, but I don't see anything with a serial killer in it. Anyway, this is the first time I heard of these guys, so uh, that.
Today's Daily Comedy News is brought to you by Monsters, Sharks, and Dinosaurs. No, it's not three separate sponsors. It's a new podcast. Monsters, Sharks, and Dinosaurs dives into the fascinating worlds of the planet's most awe-inspiring and fearsome beings. Look, I wrote most of these. I don't need the copy. I'll tell you. So episode one is Godzilla. So that's a monster. Jaws next week. Shark. Jurassic Park. Dinosaur. You get it. So we have Godzilla, then Jaws, Jurassic Park, King Kong, The Meg, and The Kraken. Those are the first six episodes. And this came out wonderful. This started with me saying to my business partner, Mark, let's just do a crazy idea. How about this? And he laughed and we're like, all right, let's see what this would be. And we started writing and we found this wonderful lane of talking about how the monster would kill you, how the monster might exist if we applied science to it, and then what are real life analogs of such a monster and what is the film history of the monster? This thing came out way better than when I first said, ah, let's do something with like dinosaurs and sharks and stuff. I'd say, help me launch this thing. Let's be real here. If I get a bunch of downloads today, it'll move up the charts. So do me a favor, especially if you use Apple Podcasts. Download Monsters, Sharks, and Dinosaurs. Monsters, Sharks, and Dinosaurs. Follow it, download it, play it. You can play it and walk your dog. You don't, I don't even care if you actually listen. Just help this thing move up the charts today. Monsters, Sharks, and Dinosaurs, wherever you get your shows, but it would mostly help if you used Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Johnny Mac, you never mentioned Shane Gillis. I know right? Slate wrote about Shane. They said, contrary to popular opinion or what you might assume from that one ignoble podcast clip, Shane Gillis has never been a MAGA comic. He's unburdened by the pickled grievance that defines an Adam Carolla or a Ricky Gervais. And I've never heard him utter the word woke on stage in spite of the anti-woke descriptor that all manner of outlets and commentators frequently append to his name. He's red state friendly, if not red state exclusive, the kind of thing that socialist Brooklynites can savor alongside their Fox News watching dads. The punchlines weren't delivered with any real invective or from a specific moral vantage, but they did underscore Gillis's broader credo. The world is funnier when he doesn't need to think about what he wants to say. Gillis has played the game perfectly. He's managed to parachute back into mainstream consciousness while still, intentionally or not, holding on to some sly anti-woke bona fides. That appears to be scaffolding for a long career. Marlon Wayans will have a new special on Amazon Prime Video, this one called Marlon Wayans, Good Grief. He will film this at the Apollo Theater in New York. Uh, great theater. Thanks, John. We had no idea. I, I got to see Springsteen there. It was amazing. Armed with his trademark wit and irresponsible energy. No, it's not irresponsible. I'm leaving it in. Irrepressible energy. He has responsible energy, which is irrepressible. Wayans dives into the depths of personal loss, grappling with the profound grief of losing both parents. From poignant reflections on the lessons imparted by his father to the unexpected challenges of caring for aging parents, including the uncharted territory of changing diapers. No date yet on that other than it'll be out in the summer. I didn't get back to yesterday. I wanted to talk more about that Bill Hicks piece that was in The Guardian. Brian Logan had asked, does anyone perform stand up like Bill Hicks nowadays? I've watched and listened to a handful of his sets over the last week or so. And the way he styles himself takes some readjusting to. It's not just the rock star posturing. The idea of himself as fearless rebel against the powers that be, it's the lack of irony. The authority assumes to preach to all of us effers who want to tell you what to think. Very few stand-ups do that now, and the ones that do, Dave Chappelle leaves to mind, are considered deeply suspect. Couldn't we do with a bit more faith in the possibility of telling the truth and exposing lies, as Hicks described his mission? You might agree with that principle, but the sexism and homophobia lands with a hell of a clunk in the 2020s. Hicks once told an interviewer, To me, the comic is a flame like Shiva the Destroyer, toppling idols, no matter what they are. Frazier's getting another season. That's it. <laughs> I mean, I could read a quote. Frazier's getting another season. And did you see this thing about the Willy Wonka event? I shared it in the Facebook group, Daily Comedy News Podcast group. The Hollywood Reporter cracks me up with the description. It looks like a meth lab. I'm not sure this is really comedy, but it makes me laugh, and why not? What was billed as an immersive experience seemingly inspired by Willy Wonka movies turned into the fire fest of unofficial movie tie-ins. You got to see the pictures of this thing. Uh, it's like an empty warehouse and somebody stuck a candy cane in the corner. It's not exactly what's in your mind when I say Willy Wonka. Now the reporter says the UK event was titled Willy's Chocolate Experience and charged customers $44 each. The attraction was not affiliated with the movie Wonka. Though the event's marketing came as close as possible to suggesting it was based on it, the ad copy invited fans to journey to a universe where confectionery dreams are brought to life. 
including mind-expanding projections, optical marvels, and exhibits that transport you into the realm of creativity and wondrous creations and enchanting surprises at every turn. The event organizers apparently used AI to generate promotional images that suggested a very high-quality attraction. I saw those images, and yeah, it looked pretty cool. As reported by The Guardian, customers showed up to a sparsely decorated warehouse with a scattering of plastic props, a small bouncy castle, and some backdrops pinned against the walls. (laughs) Scotland police were even called to the scene. The event shut down. Parents and their children were in tears. That's not funny, John, but it's kind of funny. Wonderful copywriting here, and I'll make this the end. I won't say another word after this next sentence because this is just perfect. All the event lacked was a man in a top hat telling customers, You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir.